This too is a result of years of research. I have yet to think about publishing a book on this, but after listening to Dale, I'm going like, that's a really good idea. <laughs> so um, this is not meant to be that funny. <laughs> this is form versus function, style and change in Alberta archaeology. Concepts of style, type, have influenced Alberta archaeology right from the get-go. They've influenced archaeology across the Great Plains from the get-go. And <clears throat> for much of the 20th century, all of us who have studied archaeology in great detail are very familiar with the Ford versus Spalding debates on concepts of type. That has sort of spilled into style, and then concepts of style have also expanded upon those issues. And they certainly are very useful to archaeologists to understand the dynamic changes in culture. In Alberta, it's usually been applied to projectile points, and it's been very successful in establishing sequences and cultural change. Other archaeologists have been successful in moving beyond projectile point assemblages to look at sort of the greater uh, cultural assemblages associated with the cultures we're looking at. Uh, people have brought up the issues that perhaps we should look at more than projectile points, but also look at the whole artifact assemblages that archaeologists can find and recover. And in more recent times, archaeologists have moved into looking at other aspects of material culture. Now, we're not all as lucky to be dry digging in some dusty cave in Utah to discover and recover full moccasins to actually identify cultural associations like Jack, Jack Ives has been very successful in doing. Um, but it is certainly, and Jack's work is on the forefront of this, is where can archaeologists go with this? And also, what of archaeologists themselves? What of how has archaeology been done in Alberta? So I've spent quite a bit of time thinking about this, providing research, and I asked a number of colleagues to assist and contribute their ideas and photographs. <clears throat> and after coming up with looking at the whole database I've collected, I've more or less summarized archaeology over the last 40 years and a bit beyond to get an understanding about where our roots are and where we've come from. I basically now can identify that there are two main cultural phases in Alberta archaeology. <clears throat> There's the Mackinac phase and the Tweed phase. <clears throat> tweed phase is given emphasis in its association with archaeology by often assigning small leather patches to the, to, the, to the elbows. Now certainly anybody with a leather patch on your elbow has to be able to be talking about First Nations ability of trapping animals and how you turn those animals into subsistence. <clears throat> So those are the main phases, and I regret to say that that's largely been, in modern day, trumped by the safety phase. <laughs> <laughs> but how do we come to understanding of these phases, and actually, what do they really mean? You're just taking my word for it right now, but I'll provide for you living examples here. Here we are, the tweed phase in its glory at the beginning. <clears throat> Tweed phase is often marked by sort of boardroom meetings dressed in very formal phase, uh, very formal dress. Don't be fooled by the many people in suits, but pick out the archaeologist. And the archaeologist often is seen in tweed with a pipe. That's certainly a giveaway to what the tweed phase is, stands for and what it means. When moving into the field, you doff the jacket off the tweed jackets, but you still retain the formal dress of ties and other casual clothes. Just like I said, tweed in the office, and I uh, thank you for uh, Bob Daw for providing this, is Bruce Kidd, I believe. <clears throat> uh, tweed in the office, and then you pile into the car, take all your students, pile into the car, and go have a look at some archaeological sites and it's not bothered to bother preparing to dress in any other fashion. I really have to thank Sheila Johnson for suggesting that this is really a formal area of research within Alberta archaeology. 
here you go. I told you that pipe was there, and the pipe shows up very often, in this case, Dick Forbes. <clears throat> Again, the tweed phase is sort of casual shoes, kind of dressing down, and the tweed in field situations is doffed. But you can still identify that as a tweed phase. Here you have late tweed phase expressions, and you can see, again, the casual shoes, casual dress. <laughs> and exactly the same sort of thing. We're starting to see the change of tweed phase a little bit as people are getting a little bit more casual than you would expect. But you can still see that these people are basically off the streets, right out of the offices, right into the field. <clears throat> In the very late, late stages of tweed, or even in extreme environments, often even the casual shoes are doffed and it's just bare footwear. <clears throat> or the shirts and ties are all doffed and people are just appreciating the sun of southern Alberta. Now, that's quite a clear understanding of tweed and where we've been, <clears throat> or where the origins of Alberta archaeology begin. But let's have a look at the Mackinac face. <clears throat> Now, as far as I can tell from the research I've done, the Mackinac phase originates from the wild forests of Ontario and Minnesota. <clears throat> the Mackinac phase is often characterized by a very sort of heavier embrace of the environment and a challenge that it's going to meet. And often, the, at least with the men associated with Mackinac phase, you'll see that they are bearded. <laughs> This small montage also demonstrates the fact that if your name was Jack or Brian, you're probably going to have a good career in archaeology in Alberta. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Kennedy, a very early adherent to the Mackinac phase, or the, what we now know is just the Mac. Um, <clears throat> Mark Kennedy, certainly uh, one of the early proponents of the Mackinac phase. I don't know where Mark is right now, but <laughs> um, Alison Landel's pondering whether she is part of the Mackinac phase or not, and uncertain of those associations, but I'm sure that Alison actually is really Mackinac. And here we see a very late expression of Mackinac. You can tell that it's late because most of the men are starting to look clean shaven, the beards are. <laughs> The beards are gone, and there's sort of a basic breakdown within uh, the Mackinac overall. But you still see the embracing of the sort of Mackinac checked, checked blaze, very uh, obvious locations, or obvious signifiers of this phase itself. <clears throat> I just want to harken back to what the tweed phase is. The tweed phase is very formal, very kind of we're in the field. Let's remember that uh, even in the field situations, we can set up the card table and have tea. <laughs> and then in the late tweet phase, you're starting to see a breakdown of that, where people are sort of like, hey, this is actually quite a bit of fun. Uh, I appreciate Robin. I'm sorry he's not here, but Robin certainly adhering to what the late tweet phase sort of stands for. It's like, we don't have to be quite as formal any longer. <clears throat> Earlier archaeology, this kind of relates to a transition into the safety phase. <laughs> Early archaeology is kind of like, well, let's see how we can get the dirt out of these deep pits and improvise what we can. And <clears throat> whether you're doing that by uh, rope and pulley or I don't know what other system you had. <laughs> but it generally, these in the modern day would not really pass safety standards. <laughs> And early archaeology, in, as it started to move into the more industrial level, started to see more of a chain gang approach to how people could be pressed into doing and digging out those units. <laughs> this is at the Balzac site, and one of the most interesting things is this introduces a very unknown, and like as Dale's pointed out, we can't be rigid about how we define phases, was the Bedouin phase. <laughs> and it, <laughs> the Bedouin phase, Really, the Bedouin phase really did not have much of an impact in Alberta archaeology, but it just came in and kind of just was basically found at the one site. 
and more or less hasn't really transferred into gaining any traction in the province. Other regional variants that we've had the ability to identify, and this only came up as I started to talk to colleagues. Here we have a phase, uh, a local variant being introduced from the east. <coughs> this is Heinz Pizik at Fort Victoria. Fort Victoria in 1970s. Uh, clearly, the allegiance with a culture from the East is clearly identified, <laughs> but <clears throat> give a person enough time to live in Alberta, those, those attributes can be stamped out and somebody can actually end up with an allegiance of being associated with Alberta archaeology that doesn't really give any idea of their roots. And it gives a good sense of how much cultures can change and adapt. This is sort of one of the more interesting regional variants that I've identified. <clears throat> Clearly, it's associated with southeastern archaeology in the province. The one thing I really want you to focus on is the orange hat that Ben is wearing. That orange hat is tiger orange, meaning medicine. anybody knowing the medicine hat tigers will understand what tiger orange means. In my research on this topic, I've come to realize that tiger orange has become extremely popular and swept across the province. <laughs> and I'm not sure how much Ben has to do with that. <laughs> the safety phase. In the modern day, and I'm trying to provide some examples, the safety phase kind of has moved archaeology beyond what it was. We no longer see people stuck in small pits like this. <laughs> that perhaps if you removed the ladder, they'd be there for the rest of their life. <laughs> Standards such as this, as being on the edge of a trailer to take aerial photographs is kind of uh, frowned upon. Certainly, <laughs> taking a photograph of this sort would be very much frowned upon. I mean, he doesn't even have proper PPE on. <laughs> This is my personal favorite. <laughs> Being four meters above an excavation to take a picture of that really doesn't go over in the modern day. And I think anybody can recognize that's rather precarious. All of these problems have been addressed with modern technology. <laughs> and that's where we are not now to get aerial photographs. The biggest issue is not whether you can get an aerial photograph or not, but whether it's an aerial photograph of what you want it to be. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at Jack Brink, Jack is one of the longest uh, adherents to Alberta archaeology, and I thought it'd be interesting to see where Jack fits within the Tweed versus Mackinac. And Borrowing a term from Dale, I think it's rather, Jack is actually rather syncretic. <laughs> <clears throat> but looking at Jack from now, present day, this was last year's conference, to 1975, there's little change. Even the hand's in the same spot. <laughs> <laughs> and I appreciate, Jack, your contributions to archaeology in the province for all those years. But it is an entirely syncretic style. Archaeologists at the time <clears throat> kind of had a dare do well, dare do well uh, passion to push trucks and vehicles to get into any place of the province they could, <laughs> often with not the best results. <clears throat> but as we've moved into the safety phase, nothing can stop us now. <clears throat> and so Argos and all-terrain vehicles have replaced the efforts of pushing your 4 by 4 into whatever corner. And that's allowed huge access to the province we didn't used to have. But often it's got so easy that people have a lot more time off and they just sort of sit around for coffee breaks or thereafter. <laughs> this is another northern expression of tweed. Now the reason I was having a difficulty recognizing is this tweed, is this Nakano? And it's like, and then I'm going like, oh my god, look at the pipe. <laughs> that's clearly tweed. Paul Donahue with Jack Ives. <clears throat> um, absolutely tweed, because there I have Jack, not in the field, but back in the office, 
And there's a clear adherence to Tweed here. And then in Jack's uh, coming up to speed in the modern day, there's still that Tweed, but it's sort of the breakdown of Tweed into the modern fashions. But what I found most interesting as I was collecting these is absolute evidence that Tweed and Mackinac were coeval in Edmonton. <laughs> <laughs> and it is, this is one of the biggest revelations because I was wondering, are they culturally separated? Is it just part of Southern Alberta versus Northern Alberta? But there's absolute evidence that they're coeval together, at least in Edmonton. <laughs> Barney. Barney's got one of the longest careers in Alberta archaeology, at least represented here in the room. It's a very sort of early breakdown of, <clears throat> this is, has to be the sort of tweed, uh, almost a tweed Mackinac mix, but I'm considering at the time period and the bare feet involved that this would be a sort of a casual tweed. But Barney's continued to march on and sort of added in the accoutrements of some of the Mackinac, you know, you add a beard. And it just continued to march on to his own drum, finding sites. We all appreciate that. It's a little bit difficult to classify. What people don't know is that Barney spends much of his winter in Hawaii, and in that time he channels his inner Mackinac. <laughs> so that you know, we don't know for sure where he stands, but when he's channeling inner Mackinac, it's very obvious. <laughs> so, this look at Alberta archaeology, I'd like to say we're all familiar with the basic cultural histories and where they fit. But I've been able to, and I haven't got to the book yet, but I've been able to expand this to actually establish <laughs> and extend the cultural sequence where we can see the tweed brought in the main index fossils that are associated with that, coming up to the Mac or Mackinac, with the toque is largely kind of associated as an index fossil you could look for, and in the modern day where we've moved into safety. And I think that that gives a good understanding of how archaeology has moved over the last 40 years or longer. Thank you very much. <laughs>